we get started, I have a couple of announcements I want to share. Um, always check your bulletin because there's lots of stuff in here. But I want you um, especially to see this, Sleep Well, Less Stress. It's part of the Eat Well, Live Well series. I would love to sleep well and have less stress, right? How about y'all? Um, this is uh, a partnership between the Picnic Project and Advent Health. And um, what they do is every month they have a luncheon, they have a topic. Um, Cynthia Howley is a registered nurse and she also is a nutritionist. And so it's just about what it means for us to be whole, healthy people. Um, and anybody is welcome to come. It's from 11 to 1 um, on Monday. So that's tomorrow. Oh my goodness. That's tomorrow. Um, please also check out um, the other events that we have listed. We have a really incredible opportunity to have a Black History Month event um, hosted here by the League of Women Voters. We'll learn about black history um, in Seminole County. We'll hear from uh, Judge James Perry. Um, and we'll also get to hear the Seminole Gospel Choir, which is really cool. So we're really grateful for that. Um, a couple other announcements. First of all, if you have ever thought, I would like to get involved, I would like to help, let me tell you three ways that you can jump in and serve. One is you can serve as liturgist. If you like to read um, and you particularly find the, the scriptures compelling or, or you love to participate in that, um, you don't have to pass a special test to be a liturgist. I know our current liturgists do such a good job, you might think that you have to be extra special, but we want you to know that anybody is welcome to participate in worship by helping to read the scriptures and helping with other elements in worship. We also um, are always in need of uh, volunteers, and we also have staff positions in the nursery. The nursery is for kids zero to five. Usually my two not-so kids are in there. Today they are at home. Um, but we are always in need of adults, and also teenagers can be in there um, if we have a screened adult helping with the younger children. And so if you are interested in that, if you like working with kids, that's a way that you can serve. And lastly, um, you'll see we have ushers, people who welcome people, hand out bulletins, um, help with uh, the tithes and offering time period. If you are able or interested in doing that, you can also serve in that way. Ooh, there's four. And the last one is this. He's going to be mad at me for putting him on the spot. But y'all see Scott every single week up here. He's not, I'm sorry, man. <laughs> every single week, Scott is up here uh, working hard, making the system work, um, fixing things when I break them, um, but also helping the sound and worship to flow well. If you are interested in technology, if, you, if computers make sense to you, unlike me, and sound things and light things are things you are good at, um, please know that we desperately need help. We need for worship. We need it for um, services like funerals and weddings. And we also uh, could have more than one person. Right now, Scott does all the things. So we would love to have folks um, learning that and jumping in there. Know that you are already qualified, all right? So if you have a willing heart, we will help train you. Okay, I wanna now turn our hearts toward um, our opportunity for worship, and we'll begin worshiping by sharing together the call to worship found in your bulletin. Come, let us worship the God who came to seek and save the lost. Let us worship the God who came to seek and save each of us. Let us welcome God into our homes and our hearts. Let us give of ourselves in this worship time that we may know God. Let us joyfully and with gratitude worship God. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for gathering us here this morning, welcoming us wherever we find ourselves in heart, in mind, in body. God, we thank you that we don't have to get it right. We don't have to figure out how to fix ourselves before we can show up and worship you. We thank you that you are a God who already knows us, who already loves us, and who's already come looking for us. Lord, help us to be people in this time that can turn our hearts and our minds toward your kingdom, your priorities, your heart. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Will you now stand as we sing together hymn number 400, Come Now Fount of Every Blessing. We will sing all verses. <laughs>
someone a really generous birthday gift or a really generous Christmas gift. What would that mean? Hmm? You'd be cool. That's so right. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Today we heard a story. Um, Miss Joanne just read for us a story from the Old Testament about Leviticus. Um, and it was about how we shouldn't um, take advantage of one another in the marketplace. And in the housing market, I don't know if anyone heard that. Housing market. Um, <laughs> did you hear Leviticus? 
Um, what we what we learned in the in the passage was God was talking about how important it was for us to think of other people and to not just think of keeping everything for ourselves. Now I'm going to admit something, and you don't have to admit it if you don't want. But sometimes I look at all the cookies on the plate, or I see all the change on the table, or I see all the books that I want to read, and I think if I grab them real fast, I'll keep it for myself. Do you guys ever feel like that? They're better people than me. They are. <laughs> well, that is a thing that lives in a lot of human hearts. Like we want to keep stuff for ourselves. Um, it's probably a thing that all of us are tempted by. If there's a plate of six cookies, I think, oh, maybe I want to keep all this for myself. But what God invites us to in the way that we treat our neighbor, in the way that we care for the earth, in the way that we take care of one another, God invites us to be generous. So what that might mean is even if I bring two cookies to school and my neighbor doesn't, at the table doesn't have one, it might mean I would share with them, even though I want both of those cookies for myself. It might mean that when I go to the library, if there's 10 of the Dogman books, anybody read Dogman? My son Moses is like, really? Yes, okay. Um, he like wants to check every single one out. And I think, no, we just need one, right? And then other people can check the rest of them out. Well, in all of us, there's this desire sometimes to keep everything for ourselves. But what God is inviting us to today is to be people who are generous, just like God is generous to us. So the land we live on and the air that we breathe and the earth that sustains us, all of that is a gift from God. And since it's all God's, it should be easy for us to share, right? And so that's our invitation this week is to be people who, even when it's really hard, even when I want all the cookies and I want all the cookies, to think, okay, how can I be generous? How can I share what I have to help other people? Because that is what God has done with us, to share all that we have with us. All right? Okay. Now, you also know that this, this past series, we've been inviting kids to come and help us um, in different stages of the service. Okay? So today we're going to do something called communion. That's where we share bread and juice. It's a meal that we have with God and with all. Yeah, it's cool, right? And with all of our Christian community together, and then after um, we do communion, we're going to come up there, and I'm going to pray over the table. And I want to invite you all to join me after communion, just the kids. You all come up, and we'll pray together over the communion table, okay? All right, so when I say, come on, kids, that's you. All right? Okay, let's pray together. God, we thank you for being a God who has been so generous to us. Thank you for being a God who reminds us of generosity in the face of our neighbor, in the way that kids see the world, and in the generous acts of those who have loved us well. God, help us to be people who are shaped by your generosity. And even when that little thing in us says, I'd like to keep it for myself, remind us that you have called us to share. Amen. We now have the opportunity to pray together for one another and for our world. The way we pray around here, um, there's a list in your bulletin of people who've asked us to pray, so we want to pray for those folks. And we also want to make space for whatever's on your heart and mind. Whatever it is that you want to share today, you can share aloud or silently in each section that we'll, we'll list, and then we'll close each time with, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, as you have gathered us this morning, sometimes we can take for granted the air that we breathe, the place that we live, the people who have loved us. God, we thank you for all the gifts that we can name and all those gifts that, while they may not be in our minds, have shaped our lives. God, we also come to you because we trust that you will hear us when we pray. We trust that we can lay our burdens at your feet and that you will listen. And so now, God, hear the prayers of your people. 
We pray for all those who are seeking healing in mind, body, or spirit. For all those awaiting clarity from a doctor who are undergoing treatment. For all those seeking a diagnosis. For those whose hearts are broken. And for those whose minds feel chaotic. Lord, we lift up these prayers for healing. Doris Hayes. Carol O'Neill. God, we lift up to you prayers for wisdom and discernment. For all those who are trying to figure out the next right step. For those who are seeking your guidance. For those who are seeking for hope. We lift up these prayers to you. Lord, in your mercy, God, we pray for all those who are lonely, for those who feel separated from the people that they love, for those in our jails and prisons, those who are deployed or who work different hours than they are able to see their families, for those in the foster care system and all those who care for their families. For those in nursing care facilities and everybody who feels separated from the ones that they love, we lift up these prayers for loneliness. Charlie Lord, in your mercy. <laughs> God, we pray for our enemies. We pray for people that we don't like, those we don't understand, those who have harmed us, and those that we have harmed. In our utterly divided world, God, we pray for all those who stand in opposition to one another. We pray that you would not only make us bridge builders, but that you would give us eyes to see the humanity and the dignity, even in our enemies. Lord, we pray for our enemies. Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for all that we have gratitude and thankfulness for for all the ways that you have been faithful, for all the ways that we've seen your kingdom, for all the ways that you have answered our prayers. God, we lift up gratitude to you. My son, Jen, is recommended for full ordination. The Bear Ministry. Quilt Ministry. Bible Side. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. God, we lay these prayers at your feet, and while we cannot understand what it means to be God, we know we are not. And so, Lord, we are trusting that you hear, that you act, and that you care. We're trusting, Lord, that you are at work bringing good, even out of the things that seem and that are not good. God, we pray that you would make us people who are willing to be your hands and feet in the world. Give us the courage to say yes to your invitation, and then give us the perseverance to stay at it even when it's challenging. Lord, we love you, and we are grateful. Let us now pray together the words of the Lord's Prayer. <coughs> Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
Let us now continue worshiping with the giving of our tithes and offerings. Testament reading this morning is going to be from Luke 19, 1 through 10. This is the meeting of Jesus and Zacharias. Jesus entered Jericho and he was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacharias and he was a chief ta tax collector and he was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but he was a short man. He couldn't see. There was a crowd in front of him. So he ran ahead and he climbed the sycamore tree and he tried to see Jesus who was coming. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacharias, come down immediately. I must stay at your home today. So he came down and at once he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and they began to mutter. He has gone to be with one of the guests of a sinner. But Zechariah stood up and he said to the Lord, 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 here and now, I give half of my possessions to the poor and, and I have cheated, I have cheated anybody 
out of anything I will, if I have, I'll pay them back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to your house. Because of this man, he too is the son of Abraham. You are the son of Abraham. For the son of man come and seek and he will have given and it was not lost. The word of God for the people of God. So I try not to share stories about my kids too often, but they're not here today. Um, no, I'm just kidding. I always ask permission, I promise. Um, but some of y'all have seen before the roof sign that we typically keep on our porch. I don't think it's there today, um, but we have a sign on the roof, uh, or a sign about the roof, because our roof was damaged in the hurricane. And so it's got a thermometer, you know, you can see the red rising. And we live a block and a half from here. So Moses, my six-year-old, sees that sign at least six times a day. So one Monday, every Monday, we go on a date before I drop him off for school. We go get some coffee. We just talk about our feelings, you know. Um, it's awesome. And we're leaving our time to hang out. And we drive past the church. And he says, Mommy, stop. And so we stop in front of the church. I said, what's going on? He said, you see that sign about the roof? I'm going to help. Um, what do you mean? And he said, well, can we go home right now and count my piggy bank? Uh, why, Mo? And he said, well, that I need a place to go to church, and that's my church. And so can we go home and count my piggy bank? Because I'm going to give you $2,146. I said, sweetheart, I don't think you have $2,146. He said, okay, how about $2 million? <laughs> You know, honey, I would take that too. Um, it was this incredible moment where it was out of the blue. He, he had this experience. We drove past the church, which we do all the time, but there was something in him that said, this is important to me, and I want to share what I have. Today, when we've had an encounter with God, we become more generous. Let us pray. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you because you are God and we are not. Amen. Amen. Okay, friends, we are in a series called Holy Epiphanies, Light Bulb Moments with God. We've been talking about these stories of where people encounter God and they have something in them that is changed. Throughout the series, we've talked about some characteristics like our God view gets bigger. Our people view flattens. Those hierarchies don't matter anymore. That we become more willing to risk. And today, we want to talk about the way that God shapes us to become more generous. What we know is in this story of Zacchaeus, I have no idea why it matters that he's short. Um, I'm sure there's some Greek language thing, but I love this story because it gives some random details. We come to understand in this story of Zacchaeus that he wants to catch a glimpse of Jesus. He wants to see this guy that everybody has been talking about, and so he finds a sycamore tree and climbs the tree to try and get a glimpse of Jesus. And Jesus walks right up and says, Zacchaeus, get down. Listen, I'm coming to your house today. I, I'd like to be, I'd like to come and stay at your house. And you can hear the people muttering in the background. Oh, but he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. It's almost like you can hear them muttering under their breath, like quoting Proverbs 22. Do not exploit the poor or crush the needy in court. You see, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. That meant he had been deputized by the Roman government to collect taxes. And in their day, he could collect what he owed to Rome, and then he could collect a little more for himself. But you see, he could collect a little more for himself, or a lot more for himself, because nobody was checking. Tax collectors were not beloved in this time. I know if you work for the IRS, we don't hate you, but I think tax collectors in our day, sometimes we can, we can miss that these were folks who had this incredible opportunity to exploit the poor 
and the powerless. In the moment when Jesus is on the way to his house, it's almost like Zacchaeus is confronted with the way that he has participated in exploitation. Uh, Lord, I'll give back more than what I've taken, and I'll give half of my possessions to the poor. In the face of Jesus, it's like the scales of exploitation, hoarding things for himself, they fall from Zacchaeus' eyes. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. And Jesus, just walking through the crowd, sees and prioritizes a guy that others don't necessarily like. Out of the crowds, Jesus seeks and saves Zacchaeus. How could he not be generous? If we only read this story, though, we can believe that generosity is a reaction only for the wealthy or only for those who have exploited others. Generosity in light of an encounter with God is somehow simply fixing the financial harm you've done or sharing the financial resources you have that are excess. Of course, there were women, women, in Luke's gospel who supported Jesus financially throughout his ministry. And there are folks all throughout Paul's uh, letters that, that are financially supporting the work that Paul and Timothy are doing. But that isn't the only biblical generosity that we see throughout Scripture. Ruth gives up her life to care for her mother-in-law, who would otherwise be without rights or care. Joseph, betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery, finds himself in a place of power later down the road, and he is able to keep them alive. This is what Joseph says to his brothers. Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? As for you, what you intended against me for evil, God intended for good in order to accomplish a day like this, to preserve the lives of many people. Therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. Joseph reassured his brothers and spoke kindly to them and cared for their families in generosity when they could not repay him. And then, of course, there's Mary. Mary takes nard, the expensive anointing ointment, dumps it on Jesus' feet. It would have been a year's wages. She dries his feet with her hair, and we hear Judas protest. You know, we could have sold that. We could have given the money to the poor. You see, we live in a world that sees money as the common denominator. The Bible tells us, of course, it can either be the root of all evil, or it can be used for extraordinary good, right? That's quite a breath. <laughs> and, and while we need it, money to function, it couldn't possibly capture all the ways that we are called to generosity in light of an encounter with the God of the universe. When people come to understand the bigness of God and the giftedness that they have been recipients of, how could they not be generous? Amen. We hear in Leviticus this description. By the way, I love that when Joanne said, it's from Leviticus, everyone was like, well, okay. <laughs> uh, we hear in Leviticus this description of the Jubilee year. It's this year, uh, it's the Sabbath of Sabbaths, this pattern in which people who were down on their luck got to be restored. It was like a reset button, a start over. I need one of those sometimes. People who had sold themselves to their neighbor because they couldn't afford to live anymore, could be free. The land got to rest. The poor were supported. All those who had felt down on their luck, they had a glimpse of new hope. Some folks ask, what if we practice this now? And as you read the rest of um, Leviticus 25, it's got all these things about if you live inside of a walled city, you can keep your house. But if you live outside of a walled city, it's basically just land that's going to be returned. Some of us might be kind of sad at that, right? And there been, have been some proposals that people actually, that the Israelites never actually practiced this. But I want you to hear in 1 Maccabees 6, this. They made peace with the people of Syria.
Syria and they evacuated the city because they had no food there to enable them to withstand a siege because that was the Sabbath year of the land. Did they practice it perfectly? No, we don't have a lot of accounts for that. But were there people who understood the capacity of practicing this new kind of generosity? Yeah. Also, of course, there are things that are different in our context, right? Things that we would be appalled by. It talks about uh, the, the treatment of enslaved people. But I want us to hear the way in which this gives us a broad picture of generosity that's different than sometimes we can imagine. This is a radical declaration of holistic generosity and community care. If you walked into Congress today and proposed anything like this, they might finally agree on something. That you're crazy. We can't do this. Have everybody charity. Have everybody return forgiving debts, returning land, not exploiting. Think with me for a minute about what this image communicates about God to these ancient people. They are scared on every side of being invaded or squashed, exiled, famined, impoverished, abandoned. This God is telling them, I care about the sojourner and the soil. I care about the stars and your breakfast. I care about the needs of the powerful and the utterly powerless. God calls here for rest and restoration, for return of the land, and a return to trusting God's ways, even when it feels preposterous. In light of the God of the universe who created all of this, the air that we breathe, the land that we grow our food in, the neighbor we love and the enemy that we don't, how could we not be generous? I think this is an important moment to point out that these marks of a theophany, this is what we've been talking about, a theophany is an encounter with God. We've said theophanies lead to epiphanies. An encounter with God leads to this opportunity to change our hearts and our world. But these marks of what happens after we've encountered God are not necessarily inevitable. We may have gotten the impression from previous stories that these changes that happen in us after an encounter with God just kind of magically appear. You know, I wake up and I'm just a holier person. You see God? Boom. We're done. But consider all the saints you know and the saints that you are. It's possible for us to have an epiphany, yeesh, I need to be exercising more, without making any meaningful changes in my world. It's possible for us to have an encounter with God, hey, go forgive your neighbor, and for us to decide, no thanks, I'm busy today. It's possible for us to be presented with a different way and decide, you know what, that's just too hard. Consider the rich man that encounters Jesus. He shows up and he says, look at all these things I've done. How can I be a part of the kingdom of God? And Jesus says, sell everything that you own and give it to the poor. The scripture says, he went away sad. He couldn't do it. You see, grace is resistible. God is not a tyrant. We can encounter God. We can be inspired by God. We can be utterly awestruck without deciding to participate in anything that God has invited us to. Abraham, Moses, David, Isaiah, Peter, James, John, Mary, Mary, Saul, they could have said no. Why would they? I'm not sure. Why do we? I'm not sure either. In light of the God of creation, the God of the ancient Hebrews, and the God who cares about every ounce of soil, every hair on our heads, and who cries every tear with us, how could we not be generous? 
How could we not lift up the lowly and fill the hungry with good things? How could we not welcome the stranger, share our stuff, serve the powerless? How could we not? There was a saint among us named Reggie. Reggie lived on the church steps for almost two years before getting housed. He watched out for me when I went to and from my car. He made up gospel songs when you weren't, if he didn't think anybody was around, he was making up his own gospel songs, singing to the Lord. <laughs> Reggie helped carry things. He was a prayer warrior. And one day, Reggie finally decided to come inside. He got baptized in this congregation in 2021. And he was so grateful to God and to the church. He started coming into my office every day saying, all right, what can I do to help today? And I was like, Reggie, thank you, man. You're already helping. I think we're good. One day, he was kind of agitated at me. He said, Megan, this is God's house and my church family. Of course I have to serve. Jesus took away my sins. The least I could do is take away the trash. <laughs> How could he not be generous? Friends, in light of the God of the universe, who gives, who loves, who cares, and in light of a community who walks alongside you on days when you feel like you deserve it and days when you don't. How could we not be generous? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have an opportunity today to practice together this gift given to us out of the generosity of Jesus. Every time that we gather, we don't just gather with the people that are here. We gather with everybody taking communion across the globe, all the people who've gone before us at this big cosmic table, all the people who will come after us at this big cosmic table. And in this moment, in some way, we encounter the real presence of God. Will you join me in prayer? Merciful God, we confess that we fall down. We forget. We can miss it, Lord Jesus. Help us to have eyes for the kingdom, ears for the cries of our neighbor, hearts for your love. Give us, God, what we need to say yes. Amen. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to them. And he said, this is my body, my very self, given for you. As often as you eat it, remember me. And after supper, he took the cup. He blessed it. He gave it to them. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, remember me. And so, God, we pray that you would pour out on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, your Holy Spirit. God, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. It will feel like a miracle, Lord, but make us one. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. All honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The way we eat around here is that everybody is welcome. Not just at the potluck, but at the Lord's table. This isn't my table. This isn't a table of the United Methodist Church. This is God's table. And at God's table, everybody's welcome. Wherever you find yourself today, whatever you're believing, whatever state of your heart or mind, know that the God of the universe loves you enough to have prepared a meal for you 
And that God wants to show you love today. Won't you come? We do have a gluten-free option if that's important. Um, just let uh, the servers know and we'll grab that for you. The way that we do communion is we'll have two stations here. We'll invite the ushers will invite you forward so you don't have to know where to walk. Just follow them. We'll come on down, we'll take a piece of bread and you'll get a little cup and you can consume the elements and you can uh, throw away the cups on your way back to your seat. And we also want you to know that the prayer rail is open. So if you need a little moment, if you need some time, just know we're not gonna rush you. We're actually ahead of time, okay? We're not gonna rush you. We wanna make space for you to be in prayer and, and to rest in this moment with God. Will the communion servers please come forward? <coughs>
to invite the children forward to help me with our prayer. Even if you didn't come down for children's moment and you want to join us, you're welcome. Feeding us with spiritual food. Help us to be fed so that we can love our neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you.